All right. Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful shaming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. God blesses the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Megan. Well, we've been preaching our way through Ephesians, and uh, today we're into Ephesians chapter 4, which uh, the second part, actually, of an Ephesians 4, which is very appropriate for Reformation Sunday. Nice how these things work out for us every now and again, and uh, it's a nice conjecture of Scripture and the celebration of Reformation Sunday, 503 years uh, since the Reformation. Uh, officially began with the nailing of the uh, 95th the church in Wittenberg. Let's join our hearts together in prayer for a moment. Almighty gracious God, we thank you that you love us so much that you continue to prod us on that path of sanctification. And today as we hear your word, we pray that your spirit, that ruach, that breath of life, might breathe in our hearts and lives so that we would be touched in a way that only you can touch us and we'd be shaped and molded more into your perfect image for we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Presbyterian Church in Canada annually, once a year, uh, usually, holds a general assembly and it deals with matters that are common to all the churches in the Presbyterian Church in Canada, including matters of doctrine. And in 2019, Ray Williston and myself uh, attended as um, commissioners to General Assembly. And at the 2019 General Assembly, uh, the special committee regarding implications of option B, which had to do with inclusion, ended their report with these words. At times of great stress, it seems that our differences are insurmountable. In truth, we differ theologically on many things. The role of scripture, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the place of children, of women, the priorities of the church. And yet, the church is able to coexist under the umbrella of Christ's love and the promises of the Holy Spirit. Now, to have such words expressed at General Assembly was shocking. It was shocking. And frankly, I'm still in shock. Such heresy could be expressed in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. These few sentences directly address the core issues facing the Presbyterian Church in Canada and yet minimize them, saying that we can coexist in Christ's love through the Holy Spirit despite them. Is that really possible? Can Orthodox and apostate dwell gladly together? 
Now, I ask that question with a grieved heart and out of a genuine concern for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are theologically in error, not to create or exacerbate a binary us and them duality or to dehumanize others in name calling because apostasy is a serious, serious matter. I don't use the word lightly, nor unadvisedly, nor flippantly. I grieve for the souls of my brethren and for those who are influenced by aberrant theology. Even if the most basic aspects of Christology are not commonly held, what is it that we have in common? In our sinfulness... Sadly, there is on the horizon of the Presbyterian Church in Canada a parting of the ways. Probably still years away in the future, but there's probably a parting of the ways that's on the horizon. Currently, I'm involved in several conversations with others about pulling away within the Presbyterian Church in Canada or even pulling out, departing from the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Now, we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians. And last week, the Apostle Paul stressed the importance of unity in the church. And this week, as the chapter continues, the Apostle Paul expressed the strength of diversity in the church, but he places certain safeguards and boundaries around that which are important for us today to pay attention to, especially at this time of the history of the church. Speaking of the history of the church, this is not the first time in church history that the church has lost its way. It happened prior to the Reformation, and today, of course, being Reformation Sunday, we, redis- we celebrate the church rediscovering the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. And prior to the Reformation, the church, you see, had become corrupt, emphasizing salvation as something that we somehow contribute to in some kind of a way. And thankfully, through the revelation of the scriptures and certain brave scholars, of the Reformation, like Martin Luther, which we've mentioned before, and John Calvin, both of whom are are heroes of the Reformation, the church recalled its essential theology expressed in the five solas of the Reformation. And I'd invite you to express these out loud with me this morning, whether you're at home or or here. Let's uh, say these five solas together. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. I'd invite you, seriously, to commit these five solas to memory because you can carry them with you and uh, they are so useful in reminding you and perhaps others uh, as um, uh, we can so easily fall into the subduct seductive and deceitful air of works righteousness that you somehow contribute to your salvation by something you do. It's an air that creeps into our lives so easily. Currently in the Presbyterian Church in Canada, our Reformed roots have been largely forgotten or have been so badly misconstrued that they're unrecognizable, resulting in an operative theology which is not around the mission of the church, but around humanitarian issues of justice and relief couched in the language of love. Now, please don't get me wrong. We are all called to love our neighbor, and that's more relevant today in these COVID days than ever. However, when we make an idol out of love rather than the first love of the church, we have lost our way. Ernest Shackleton was the leader of the Imperial Trans Trans Antarctic Exposition, and he courageously set out in a small boat to cross approximately 1,500 kilometers from the Antarctic to South Georgia Island in search of rescue after their ship, the Endurance, was totally crushed by sea ice. And they made that perilous journey 
through those terrible seas with the most rudimentary of navigational equipment in April of 1916. Had they navigated off course just one degree, they would have missed South Georgia Island completely and they would have sailed off into oblivion. It was a navigational miracle that they got it right in their 14 days in that small boat called the James Caird. And as a result, their whole crew left behind in Antarctica were rescued. Folks, the mission of the church is very much like that. We are on a rescue mission, and we have to get it right. Even a slight deviation can end in disaster, not just for us, but for others who are depending upon us to get it right. I was deeply touched by the heart of a former elder of this congregation, Bill Ross, shortly before his death expressed his deep concern for me as a pastor of this church in what I've been charged with, the responsibility that I am charged with because he knew that I would be one day held accountable before God for what I do or what I fail to do in proclaiming Christ. He recognized my responsibility for your soul care and he and, and to get it right. He recognized that responsibility. Believe me, I want to get this right for your sake. But even in that motivation, you see, works righteousness can creep into our spiritual lives like an invasive virus, not unlike COVID-19, sickening the church into death. And the Presbyterian Church in Canada stats report and the acts and proceedings of General Assembly between 2010 and 2020 that we have lost 30,000 members in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. That's more than the entire population of Dieppe. It's gone. When humanitarian concerns, which are worthy concerns, don't get me wrong, they are worthy concerns, But when they become the dominant expression of our Christian faith at the neglect of the central mission of the church to make disciples, what happens is the church dies. The church dies. It dies because we're no longer doing what we have been uniquely entrusted to do. There are lots of humanitarian organizations, lots of NGOs in this world that are doing great work, but they cannot do what the church does. That's a unique mission of the church. Our passage speaks of getting it right. Now, consider the context of the passage before us this morning. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul lays down the theological framework for what is to follow. And in the first part of chapter 4, the Apostle looks at the priority of unity in the church, bringing both Jews and Gentiles with centuries of animosity and conflict between them, bringing them together as one body in Christ with a common purpose. One purpose, even though they're so vastly different. And our passage begins, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, You might think that the Apostle Paul was thinking about his own sordid history of needing amazing grace, needing a lot of forgiveness for having been a persecutor of Christians before becoming a Christian himself. Or or maybe you would think that the Jewish people were, were thinking of Gentiles needing more forgiveness than they did because they considered themselves to be closer to the throne of God. Well, perhaps they did. Who knows? But humbly... We need to be reminded that no one is perfect. Well, maybe my wife is. But when I come to think about it, she's not either, actually. And Romans reminds us 
all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All of us are prone to sin. By our very nature, we're prone to sin. And as a result, we're in need of the forgiveness that God offers through his son, Jesus, and what he's done for us on that cross on Calvary, in our place, dying in our place, the place that we deserve to die in. However, what this passage is actually addressing is something about human dynamics, that is, jealousy between peoples, even Christians, brings us to our first point, which is diversity with purpose. I'm looking, if you're following along in your Bibles, you might want to look at Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm looking at particularly at verses 11 through to 12. Now, I'm a minister of the gospel, and it's not a ministry that I chose. It's not a ministry that I chose. It's one that I was given. I would quite frankly, rather have been a farmer than a minister of the gospel. And I started out in that direction as I enrolled at Guelph University in a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture program. But God had different ideas. He had different ideas. And even though I initially resisted his calling, eventually I responded to his call out of a sense of obedience not out of choice, but out of a sense of obedience. I chose to be obedient in this matter. And that's how it works with the church. Christ calls some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, and they each have a place in the kingdom's work. And that place is to prepare others for the work of ministry. That's why verse 12 tells us to equip his people for works of service. That's the role of these various people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to equip his people for works of service. Now, in other words, we are all called to be ministers. Each and every one of us are called to be ministers. There is no place of jealousy between the various ministries of the church because all of the parts are needed. Elsewhere in Romans chapter 12 or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle likens the church to a physical body where every part is needed to function well. For you to function well in your role, you need the ministries of all the other functions of the body of Christ. So there is no superiority or inferiority. All the parts are needed, which means your ministries, whatever they may be, your ministries are needed too. You can't afford, you see, to be a spectator in the Christian church without weakening the whole church. John Calvin, the great reformer, writes of this passage in his Institutes of Christian Religion, and he doesn't hold anything back. He writes, They therefore are insane who, neglecting this means of building up the church, hope to be per- uh, help to be perfect in Christ, as is the case with fanatics who pretend to have secret revelations of the Spirit, and the proud who contend themselves with private readings of the Scripture and imagine that they don't need the ministry of the church. You see, there is no place for privatized Christian faith completely apart from the body of Christ COVID-19, however, feeds into that privatistic type of faith. And with the restrictions that uh, are in place uh, from time to time, they deter participation in the church. Now, I admire, I really do admire the leadership of our provincial and federal medical experts through this COVID-19 crisis. They're doing a great job in incredibly difficult circumstances, and I applaud them. 
even though I don't agree with the decisions that they make necessarily, particularly around church closures. The purpose of the diversity of the gifts of the church is to equip the church for the work of ministry. In other words, no one is off the hook. No one is off the hook. Whether you're eight years old or 88 years old, you have a role to play in the mission of the church. John Stott, the author and pastor and theologian, he writes, if the 16th century recovered the priesthood of all believers, every Christian enjoying through Christ a direct access to God, perhaps the 20th century will recover the ministry of all believers, every Christian receiving from Christ a privileged ministry to others. All spiritual gifts, then, are service gifts. This is their purpose. They're not given for selfish, but for unselfish use, namely for the service of other people. However, you need to be equipped for that ministry whatever form it may take. And that brings us to our second point for this morning, which is destined to maturity. And I'm looking particularly at verse 13 here, if you're following along. Now, it's hard to believe that I'm a grandparent, twice over already. Recently online, we celebrated the second birthday of our first grandchild, Lila. There's a picture of her, I think, that's going to come up for her for you in a moment. There's Lila. Now, what grandparent doesn't want to brag about their grandchildren once in a while. eh? Now, I don't know if Lila ate that whole cake or not, but I do know that she doesn't eat the same food now than when she was born. She graduated from milk to pablum to other foods which she now eats, and soon she'll be competing with me for my steak. She could not develop to maturity unless her diet changes as she grows. Likewise, we as Christians need to change our diet in order to grow. We need to change our diet in order to grow. The author of the book of Hebrews grieves over some in the church who had not grown in the church or grown in their faith, and he writes in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, in fact, Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Sadly, that's the sad state of many in the church today. Many who have been need to be reminded of the elementary truths of the gospel once again and truthfully, there are some within this congregation who are in that, in that state of being. The need to grow in order to grow in unity of the faith. And such is the prevalent state within our denomination as well. That phrase, unity in the faith, means growth in belief in Jesus Christ himself which is intrinsically linked to knowledge of him, a personal relationship with him, experiencing his presence in our lives. Now consider this call to maturity. You see, it's embedded in Jesus' last words to the disciples in the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, we read there, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which we heard about a little earlier, and teaching them, it says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, the goal here, you see, is to make disciples mature disciples. That's the desired outcome. That's the desired product That's the desired aim of the church, to make mature disciples. Jesus himself experienced growth throughout his life. The same Greek word that was used in our passage to describe growth 
describe Jesus' growth in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, where we read that Jesus grew in stature. Jesus himself, the Son of God, grew in stature. The church is called to a similar growth in Christ. And it, it doesn't talk about perfection here. That can never happen on this side of glory. Just, just growth. Growth like children growing into adulthood. And it begs the question for you this morning. What are you doing to aid your growth in Christ? What is it that you are doing to aid your growth in Christ? Participating in worship is great. It's wonderful that we have people online joining us as they are and people who are worshiping with us here in person. That's wonderful. But there's so much more that you could be doing to aid your growth toward maturity in Christ. If you break it down into four general areas, let's explore those a little bit this morning. First of all, spiritual growth through your engagement with God. Your engagement with God. Things like worship and praying continually and regularly checking in with God, you know, asking God, Lord, have I glorified you well in how I've lived out this morning, how I've lived out this afternoon, this evening, even the last hour, or experiential growth through engaging with experience, things like spiritual disciplines like prayer and fasting and solitude and silence and study and mission work and sacrifice, or spiritual growth through relational experiences, things like serving other people encouraging other people, fruits of the Spirit being exhibited, participating in study groups or in community of one form or another, or spiritual growth, fourthly, through engaging with truth, things like growth in biblical knowledge, exploration of theological doctrine, reading instructional books, videos, blogs, etc. Now, come Christmas time this year, I'll be distributing some devotional materials that will help you grow in your understanding of the priority of the authority of the Word of God, the Scriptures. Besides Christological issues, that's a very, very significant issue in the Presbyterian Church in Canada, residing under the authority of the Word of God. Following that, I'm in the process of preparing some materials for you next year to help your understanding and sexuality issues that are facing the Presbyterian Church in Canada, placing revisionist views right beside traditional understandings uh, so that you can compare the teachings from different positions. George Anderson's sermon that he preached the end of August uh, will be distributed as well as some other materials aiming to help you become more fluent in the truth on these matters which will become increasingly important as St. Andrews moves forward in the coming years. See, there are lots of things that you can do to aid your growth in maturity. It's part of the grand adventure of faith. It's a grand adventure of faith because there's always, always another growth opportunity before us as the Holy Spirit moves us along that path of sanctification. Growth enables us in a stable relationship with Christ. That brings us to our fourth, our third point for this morning, focused on verse 14, called uh, Defended by Truth. Now, boundaries uh, can be very helpful in our lives. Peter Marshall once said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And one of the common themes of the writings of the Apostle Paul is Paul's refuting of false teachers. The book of Colossians, for example, is almost solely devoted to that subject. But grounded in the word of God, we develop the critical tools that we need that are necessary to be able to separate essential theological issues from non-essential issues. 
In Ephesians and in the other churches of Asia Minor, to which the uh, book of Ephesians was directed at the time the Apostle Paul wrote this, they struggled more with syncretism than with outright heresy. Now, in later times, it struggled more with outright heresy. The, the church in Ephesus and there are various places in Scripture where we find heretical struggles of the Ephesians mentioned. Syncretism, though, was common at the time that Paul wrote this letter. And it's common in our day and age as well. Very common right now among us. It basically cherry picks the best of different faith traditions that appeal to me personally for one reason or another and holds them up as what I uniquely believe in. And the trouble is such an approach actually dilutes the truth of the gospel. Syncretism says things like, well, we're both saying the same thing. These concepts of salvation, redemption, they're found in all world religions. Christianity is not so different than other world religions. New Age philosophies, in particularly, they tend to pick out common patterns that are common to all faiths. The trouble is, Christianity is unlike other world religions. It is completely different than other world religions. Jesus said things, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 36. He did not say, let each person find God in his own way. Jesus said, I am, categorically, I am, emphatic Greek language construction here, ego, I, me. I, I and nobody else is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He did not say all paths end up in the same place. Jesus said, whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. He did not say whatever you choose to drink is as good as any other choice. You see, among world religions, Christianity is the only world religion that depends exclusively on what God has done for you instead of what you do for God. The resource for personal study that I'm working on now, which will be available in the new year for you on human sexuality, reveals just how deceptive interpretation of the scriptures can be by the cunning and craftiness of deceitful people in their scheming. The best antidote, the best antidote is biblical fluency in the truth. The best antidote is knowledge in the Son of God so that you will know the truth, you'll walk in the truth, you'll live in the truth, you'll love others enough to tell the truth when they go astray. So in conclusion this morning, the other day I was watching a television program called Disaster at Sea. It was the account of that BC ferry called the Queen of the North, which ran between Port Hardy and uh, Prince Rupert. And it sank after running aground on an island on March the 21st in 2006. 99 out of the 101 on board were actually rescued. And the story explored what happened, what caused that ferry to sink. And apparently the ship failed to make a course correction 14 minutes earlier before it hit the island and sank. And it was due to human error. Humans who were on the bridge were distracted at that time. When we pay attention to maturity in Christ, aspiring toward attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, we will not fail to make course correction in our lifetimes when we err thing is, we all do sin, every one of us, without fail. However, 
Will we become hardened in heart to a point where we will no longer seek out the amazing grace of Christ that he seeks to lavish upon us? Or will we rely on that grace and become so familiar with the way and the ways of our Lord that we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of, de- of people in their deceitful scheming. The problem of our denomination and many denominations in the western part of the church today is that we've failed to chart the right course. We failed to make the correct course corrections along the way. Now, you have a part to play in the future of this congregation, its mission, in seeking maturity in Christ and encouraging others to grow in the truth, continuing in the truths that the Reformation, which we celebrate today, are revealed to us, in us, and through us by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Amen.